powerful, you know, people in the city, senior bankers, uh, head of the Trade Association, the British Bankers Association, you know, ministers, regulators. Uh, they rang up the BBC, spoke to the Director General, spoke to the Director of News, said, close Peston down. This is all too dangerous. British people, it's too, this is all too too difficult and scary for British people. This is, you know, they actually use the analogy of a time of war. And, you know, they said there should, there should be a, the equivalent of a denoted. So I shouldn't be allowed to tell the world um, how much trouble our banks were in. Really fascinating to hear from today's guest, Robert Peston, uh, ITV's political editor, of course. He was formerly of the FT. He's also worked at the BBC, both as business editor and as economics editor. And somehow he's found a couple of moments in his absurdly busy schedule to write another pacey thriller. This one is called The Crash. Uh, Robert, hello. Good afternoon. How are you? Um, not too bad. Lovely to see you. Very nice to see you. Thank you very much for coming on the programme. Now, The Crash is set a decade after your first novel, The Whistleblower. Uh, mm. But the central character is still the same. It's Gil Peck, but he's moved out of the dirty world of newspapers and into broadcasting. And um, how is he finding it? Uh, he's having an exciting time uh, in, in the sense that there's quite a big story that he's chasing. He's slightly obsessed with getting scoops and he's quite obsessed with the business of being a journalist. And so the collapse or, you know, what he thinks is a period in which banks are, banks are going to collapse and we're all going to pay a big price for their recklessness. Well, you know, I, I imagine like all of us at the time, he was sort of felt this was all a bit sad for the UK, but it kept him very busy and he likes being busy. Now, um, at the time of the financial crash, crash in 2007, just remind everybody what your role was. Yeah, I sort of assumed you'd ask uh, or remind people. I mean, so weirdly, I was also at a leading broadcaster um, trying to get scoops about the crash. Right. Uh, so obviously that, Fee and I have already discussed the fact that we are bound to ask you, uh, is Gil Peck a not so heavily disguised Robert Peston? No, uh, but there are lots of things about Gil Peck that I have experienced and there are certain of his character traits that are my character traits. But no, it's not a sort of... Um, <sighs> disguised uh, autobiography uh, it is um, a bit of fun actually uh, I mean I can't, I can't remember I think I might have talked to you about uh, the whistleblower um, when it came out which as you say was sort of part one and I just sort of took the view since I've come to sort of fiction writing and thriller writing late in life that it would be probably sensible to minimize at least some of the risks of you know going into an area that was sort of relatively new to me and I just therefore thought why not write about worlds that I know intimately yeah uh, uh, and and I thought that way uh, I could at least make it feel authentic sure uh, yeah so but I guess, I guess the problem with that is that yes you do know this world intimately but frankly the rest of us don't and there's a there's a level of detail um and there's an intricacy to some of that detail it, it needs explaining doesn't it in plain English which is one of the problems you have when you write a book like this I guess I suppose so I mean I've been quite I mean I I, I mean if you're saying you hated it because uh you know bits of it were uh, about bits of the city that you didn't find very interesting, and you didn't, you weren't, you know, you 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 weren't um, intrigued to sort of learn more. Then I can only apologise to you. Um, I mean, what I tried to do was, um, you know, as I say, it, it, it's it's got to be compelling, and it's compel it's got to be compelling in two ways. One, it's got to be entertaining and fast paced, and there's got to be lots of action and mystery and all the rest of it. And I hope there's that in this book. Mm. Um, but equally. Um, it can't be stupid. No, I mean, no, I didn't. I didn't dislike it at all, Robert. I thought it was a proper page turner, to be honest. But I, I, can we just get on to the to the fact that your character Gill, um, he's kind of put off the story by his employers because, or at least there's an attempt by the banks, frankly, to steer him away from doing the story. So, did that happen to you? How much pressure were you under at the time of the crash to, frankly, keep your trap shut? Uh, so there were sort of. There are, there are a couple of aspects of, of this. I mean, one is I, I about nine months before everything went bad, um, 
I did. I was a little bit frustrated because I went to see there was a particular senior editor at the BBC uh, who I went to see, and I just said, "Look, I think you know we are going to have a crash, and uh, uh, it, it is going to be you know not only bad for the city, but because of the central role that um, all these institutions play in our lives, it's going to." you know, lead to recession, going to damage us. And this individual said, well, what, you know, when's it going to happen? And I said, well, the problem with crashes is um, you can see the direction of travel that you're going in, that they're going to happen at some point, but, uh, you know, pre- forecasting with precision when it'll happen, well, you know, that's more art. It's more art. It's not a science. And this particular editor said, oh, well, look, I mean, you know, it can therefore, you know, you know it can hold this story. <laughs> uh, so that was that. But but so, um, but then actually, you know, because the BBC um, was a place that was incredibly interested in exploring, I think, quite challenging things. They then did let me do some broadcasting mm. on the crash actually happened after i did the northern rock story then that's when the heat got turned up and it got turned up very considerably um people sort of wrongly you know blamed me that you know they blamed the messenger they blamed me for the run at northern rock after i disclosed that it had run out of money and gone you know cap in hand for the bank of england for support and at that point yeah i mean you know um the powerful, you know, people in the city, senior bankers, uh, head of the Trade Association, the British Bankers Association, you know, ministers, regulators, uh, they rang up the BBC, spoke to the Director General, spoke to the Director of News, said, close Peston down. This is all too dangerous. British people, it's too, this is all too, too difficult and scary for British people. This is, you know, they actually use the analogy of a time of war. And, you know, they said there should, there should be a, the equivalent of a D notice and I shouldn't be allowed to tell the world um, how much trouble our banks were in. I have to say, um, Mark Johnson, who was Director General at the time, and Han Bowden, who was Director of News, were um, both actually um you know really sort of tough and told these people that you know the work that i we were doing was very much in the public interest people mm. had to know what was going on and told them all to hop off uh, and uh you know there've been there's been quite a lot of talk recently that bbc maybe doesn't have enough backbone it certainly had backbone then and i'm forever grateful to both helen and uh Mark, for letting me do my job. Can you just explain what a D notice is? Because not everybody will know that term. So a D notice is a notice that, that at a time, particularly of war, um, you know, essentially is issued to media organisations to basically stop them reporting on information that um, could be damaging to the security of the UK. And, you know, there was genuinely an active debate at the time because... Um, the stakes were very high economically about trying to persuade, as I say, people like me not to tell British people quite the sort of scale of the reckless things that the bankers had done. What, what does come across in the book, certainly Gil Peck's world, is one of, well, it's actually it's a kind of cabal of people who were all at Oxford together and have all risen to prominent positions at sort of around the same time. And they're absolutely hideous, pretty much all of them. Uh, and there are some, some quite debauched parties that you describe. Um, this is a very, very depressing view of Britain. I mean, Robert, is this still how Britain is run? I mean, yeah, I mean, look, I, I, obviously when you write a book of this sort, you make it probably a little bit more extreme than the reality. But, yeah, I mean, you know, this place was run, is run uh, by people who certainly went to the same university, in some cases, as we know, uh, in recent times, went to one school in particular, um and it is you know the elite in this country is a genuine elite um and yeah they do all know each other and i think some of the morality i mean you know in both books there's a lot of very dodgy morality and i'm afraid that does describe um quite a lot of how powerful people behave and do you consider yourself part of that i mean this is a incredibly difficult question i mean my I've never considered myself part of some uh, uh, elite in the sense of, uh, of of somebody who sort of, you know, wants to run things. I have always considered myself to be somebody who shines a light on the world, tries to explain the world um, to uh, 
you know, the 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 people who either you know watch my broadcasts, organise newspapers, read my newspaper articles. You know, I've got a I've got a new podcast which I might as well promote. Listen to my, listen to the new podcast. Look, I can't deny that having been to Oxford myself, that that can you know that that you know. It, it opens doors. Um, you, know, I, you know, I know all sorts of, you know, partly through having gone to that university, all sorts of people who I probably wouldn't have met if I'd gone a different route. I, um, and, you know, I went to a North London comprehensive. Did I think, I mean, some, some you know, when I was, I mean, weirdly, when I was 10 or 11, partly because I was obsessed with history and the Master of Balliol was a particular historian that I admired, pretty much from the age of 10 or 11, despite the fact that I went to this North London Comprehensive, I was pretty sure I wanted to go to Balliol College, Oxford, and that's where I ended up. But I, 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 I didn't go there thinking that I was going to meet all these people who would end up running the country. No, but it did to sort of slightly turn out that way. And the, the weird thing about the Oxbridge thing is that even if... I mean, there were some some of my contemporaries um, obviously ended up in positions of some uh, importance, but just weirdly, just uh, you know, it is a it is, and I, I'm afraid all the, you know you get the same thing in France, you get the same thing in America. Um, there is just it's a, it's a part of the inequalities and the unfairnesses of this world is you know you end up at a particular university and it sort of introduces you to a network of people that you know undoubtedly are pretty helpful uh in well, terms yes. of whatever, whatever whatever you end up doing it and, does seem and, to work that way yeah i mean you you actually mentioned well, it it's, 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 you know it's, it's just another one of those awful unfairnesses yeah about, really. um in an interview with the times actually with andrew billen a couple of days ago you actually said that rishi sunak was better informed about financial matters than his predecessors um he's obviously got a lot of experience he worked for goldman sachs didn't he and he might be working for them again and for, and for, a, and for a hedge fund yeah yeah, yeah right. um but i mean is there any evidence at all that his clearly his, his profound knowledge of the subject is actually benefiting us as, as a country well i think uh this is not a very profound thought that uh, you know a prime minister who does the work and reads the documents and you know thinks uh more deeply about uh uh, you know, whether you, you know whatever the issue is i i think that's a better thing rather than a worse thing and he definitely does the work i mean I, you know, my uh, job is to be impartial, and you know that you, you, we can all have views about the effectiveness. I mean, you can have ideological views about whether his policies are good or bad, and then you can have views about whether they're effective or not. And you know, I think we could argue at the moment that his policy on um, reducing the number of people risking their lives coming across in small boats is not working very well. I mean, to be frank, since large numbers are still coming across mm. in small boats, and we've got this sort of massive problem of a lot of stateless people here growing by the day, not al not able to work, somewhat sort of stranded. It's you know, you could argue this is a very very bad phenomenon. Um, and so you can, you know, so I'm very happy to judge policies on the basis of whether they work or not. But I can tell you that, you know, whether, you know, whether it's a good or bad policy. And um, as I say, it's definitely not working very well at the moment. Um, but I mean, also, we're at a strange place when we when you um, decide that because Mr. Sunak puts in the work, he's perhaps a, perhaps a little bit better than some of his immediate predecessors, because it's I mean, why, why it's the least off? I expect. I mean, I want them to. They've, they've pursued positions of power. The least they can do when they get there is put the hours in, surely. Yeah, I mean, you know, you would say you would think that, wouldn't you? But you know, we've 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 lived through a time when you couldn't necessarily take that for granted. <laughs> yes, and here we are, right. so Robert. Do you think um, it is inevitable that Labour will win the next election? Oh, nothing is remotely ever inevitable uh, in this particular uh, period of our history. Uh, it is astonishing how fast public opinion can shift and it's also astonishing um how people are acting in ways that we thought they wouldn't do um so i, I it's definitely not inevitable but um it is also incredibly uh difficult for a government to win an election having um been in office and overseen both chaos some would say of its own making and we think obviously of this trust his mini budget um and uh having um had a prime minister who held 
uh, illegal parties in Downing Street and uh, having right now a period of economic stagnation, high inflation, squeezes in living standards that are leaving, uh, you know, millions of mm. people in, you know, pretty rum old difficult states. So, um, and then, you know, you've had opinion polls that have shown Labour have significantly ahead, 15, 16 percentage points now for a good year or so. So, I mean, you know, as I say, I, it, it, it's um, very likely that Labour will win the general election. But, if, you know, if I were Keir Starmer, um, uh, you know, I wouldn't be engaging in hubris, no. Uh, and um, he's up against it in the sense that there's a limit to what he can actually say, isn't there? <laughs> Which is why he's not saying a great deal. Uh, we don't actually know what too many of their policies are going to be because it's he's doing that thing about, what is it, carrying the Ming vase across a, across a sitting room or something? Yeah, I mean, look, I do think that um, he could probably, uh, you know, and maybe he is now beginning to to do this. He could probably show a little bit more about what he stands for and what he's going to do. I mean, you know, uh, you know, only in the last uh, twenty four hours we have seen him come up with a different kind of immigration policy from the one that um, Rishi Sunak uh, has adopted and taken some risks in terms of talking about closer cooperation with the EU and uh, actually ending this position of uh, making it completely impossible for any asylum seeker who crossed the channel to apply for asylum. So, you know, he is taking some risks and, you know, maybe that'll continue. So maybe we will know a little bit more about who he is and what they stand for. And we've got about a year to go. Um, things like the triple lock, which are of huge interest, actually. Um, what on earth can any government do about that that doesn't just put off potential voters? I mean, the problem with 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 um, sort of rational debate about so much of this stuff is, you know, we, you know, all parties want to win elections, and older people tend to be the people who vote, as you know. Um, and one of the reasons I'm absolutely certain that uh, the government will, you know, or the you know Conservative Party under you know, will put the renewal of the triple lock into their manifesto is. Um, Rishi Sunak needs votes. Uh, he doesn't want to alienate older people. I, I mean, I, I, you, I think there are sort of two things, though, to say about the triple lock, which slightly pull in in different directions. Um, one is um, that, yes, uh, it has been very expensive uh, and will become even more expensive um, the uh, at a time when there's... Um, you know, public finances are frankly in a mess uh, and, you know, quite a serious mess. Um, and I think it's the IFS has calculated that the triple lock could add um, something like £45 billion pounds to public spending uh, by 2050. So and that's in real terms. That's a lot of money. Uh, on the other, and, and, and it's also true that relative to younger people, um, older people have done very well out of government. Uh, policy over the last uh, sort of 13, 14, 15 years. Uh, pension has gone up about 14% in real terms, while benefits for people of working age have fallen 9% in, in, in real terms. So you, but on the other hand, it's not that long ago. I mean, you know, you, you, you may remember that in the 80s and 90s, pensioner poverty was a very, very serious problem in this country. And it's a good thing that pensioner poverty, poverty has been eradicated. I think the challenge is not to force, is, you know, the, 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 the goal can't be to, you know, allow pensioners to fall back into poverty. The goal has got to be how do you lift working age people mm -hmm. out of poverty? That's got to be the ambition. So, Robert, you've worked in these two huge fields of importance in terms of policies. You've worked across finance and you've worked across politics itself. But for most of us, what money boils down to is just how much we can hang on to, how much we can Ooh. earn in our lifetime. So if somebody gave you £10,000, what would you do with it at the moment, given all of that exquisite wisdom? Um, can I just ask you a question? Is, is this ten? Is, is this ten thousand? It's your own money, Robert. Doesn't, doesn't need <laughs> yeah. to, I'm not to, saying I'm going to give you ten thousand pounds. Let's just be clear about that. No, no, no. But I mean, I'm just saying, is this? Is this? So, because it always depends on whether this is ten thousand pounds 
that you can sort of lock away and 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 not worry about. As well, it I were. suppose I'm asking you to look across the world at everything that's happening. Look at all of the uncertainty. Where would you put it? I'd put it into some aspect of artificial intelligence. I mean, I'm very very excited about uh, what is undoubtedly a big industrial revolution that we're just starting. Um, it's going to transform the world of work, um, and it could. Uh, actually do something about the, the the biggest problem that m- many Western countries have. In fact, we've got yet another book coming out in a few weeks, which is called Bust, and which is looking at essentially big problems that the UK and other Western countries are facing in terms of our living standards and public services and just, you know, the mess we're in. Uh, also the political crises, many of us, many, many countries are in, including the UK. Um, and, you know, artificial intelligence is both exciting and scary. It, it, it does it does offer the potential to give us greater growth, but it could also lead to very significant job losses. It could also allow it proliferates. Uh, uh, it, 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 it could allow very bad people to create, you know, chemical weapons and you know various weapons of mass destruction from their uh, garages. So it has to be regulated very well. Um, we're a long way from seeing that kind of regulation. So you know, it's you know, it's it's a really big social and yeah. economic change that we're, we're that we're starting with. And if you're just looking for something to, if, you know, if you're genuinely saying, well, where would you put your money? You would put your money into some aspect of all of this that's going to benefit from, from artificial right. intelligence. Well, thank you for that. That's a tip I'll write down. Just very briefly, um, you did come out uh, with a very supportive statement about Hugh Edwards at the time of his suspension. I know you work very closely with his wife. How is he? Is he all right? Uh, do you know what? He's a friend. She's a friend. I'm really that's that's their private life. I'm not going to get into any other. Okay. I mean, other than to say, you know, I, you've got to stand by your friends, and I do stand by them. Fair enough. Thank you very much indeed for your time, Robert. That's Robert Peston, ITN's political editor and author of a book called The Crash. Um, it is a new thriller, and it's set around the time of the banking crisis back in 2007. The central character is that incredible well-connected, very, very buccaneering journalist called Gil Peck. And if you like the first book, The Whistleblower, I'm sure you'll love this one too.